Hello, and thanks for joining us for this episode of Into the Killing. We're always looking for interesting cold cases that were eventually solved to cover on the podcast. If you know of one, please visit our website, criminallisted.com, and then go to the Suggest a Case page. On that same page, you can also suggest cases for our true crime channel, Criminally Listed, and our channel about the supernatural, Paranormally Listed. For today's episode, we're going back to December 1988. On December 1st, 1988, Vazir Bhutto became Prime Minister of Pakistan. She was the first woman to lead a Muslim-majority country. She held the position for two years, and then there was a vote of no confidence. For the next three years, she was the leader of the opposition. In 1993, her party, the Pakistan People's Party, won the election, and she became Prime Minister for a second time. She held the position until 1996. After that, she was chair, or co-chair, of the Pakistan People's Party, until 2007. On December 27, 2007, 54-year-old Benazir Bhutto spoke at a rally. Suddenly, a gunman fired several rounds. Then a suicide bomber detonated his device. Bhutto and at least 23 other people were killed. There are conflicting reports regarding her death. It's not known if she was shot or killed in the explosion. The same day that she became Prime Minister, Roy Orbison played his final show at the Front Row Theater in Cleveland, Ohio. Orbison got his start in the music business in 1956 when he was 20 as a member of the Teen Kings. The band broke up and Orbison started his solo career. In the early 1960s, he had tremendous success with songs like Only the Lonely and Oh Pretty Woman. The early 1960s was an amazing time for Orbison, but the latter half of the 60s was a nightmare. On June 6, 1966, his wife, Claudette, was killed in a motorcycle accident. Two years later, on September 14, 1968, Orbison's house in Hendersonville, Tennessee caught fire. Tragically, the two oldest of his three sons were killed. Roy Duane was 10 and Anthony King was 6. After that, Orbison took a two-year hiatus from writing and recording music. Then in 1975, he quit the music business. But he didn't stay away too long. In 1980, he recorded That Love and You Feeling Again with Emmy Lou Harris. The song was a hit, winning a Grammy for Best Country Performance for a Duo or Group. The single relaunched Orbison's career. In 1988, Orbison joined the supergroup, The Traveling Wilburys, with Bob Dylan, George Harrison, Jeff Lynne, and Tom Petty. In November 1988, Orbison recorded his 22nd studio album, Mystery Girl. On December 1st, 1988, Orbison played his last show. Five days later, he died of a heart attack. He was 52 years old. Mystery Girl was released posthumously in January 1989. The album contained the single, You Got It, which reached number 9 on the Billboard Hot 100. On December 2, 1988, ESPN aired its 10,000th episode of its flagship program, Sports Center. The Daily Sports Show debuted in September 1979. It was the kickoff to ESPN going on the air. At 10,000 episodes, it was the most televised American cable show. As of 2024, they have aired over 60,000 episodes, holding on to the title of Most Televised American Cable Show. On December 2, 1988, the number one song in America was Baby, I Love Your Way by the dance pop group Well to Power. The song is a medley of Baby, I Love Your Way by Pierre Frampton and Freebird by Leonard Skinner. The number one movie was the modern retelling of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, Scrooge, starring Bill Murray. Three Rivers is a small city in southern Michigan. In 1988, the city had a population of just over 7,000 residents. 19-year-old Kathy Schwartz lived in a townhouse with her fiancé, Michael Warner, and her nine-month-old daughter, Courtney. Warner was not Courtney's father. Kathy grew up in the small village of Menden, Michigan. Her family owned a farm. Her family moved to Three Rivers when she was in high school. In March 1988, she dropped out of school because she gave birth to Courtney. Michael Warner and Kathy had met four months earlier in September. In November, they got engaged. In early December 1988, the young family was preparing for Courtney's first Christmas. The tree was set up and there were several presents under it. Courtney was going to receive several stuffed Muppets for Christmas. On the night of December 1st, 1988, they had a quiet night at home. 
Kathy and Warner ate fish and chips and then played board games. They got to bed around midnight. Half an hour later, some friends knocked on their door. Warner opened the bedroom window and told them that they were in bed. Warner got up early the next morning to work his shift at a paper plant. He kissed Kathy and left at 5.25 a.m. He returned home at 3.30 that afternoon. He put his key into the lock and turned it. In the front foyer, he noticed a few drops of blood but didn't think much about them. But he became disturbed when he made it to the stairs. The walls were smeared with blood. When he reached the second floor, he checked Courtney's room first. She was unharmed in the crib. Then he looked in the bedroom that he shared with Kathy. The room was splattered with blood. On the floor was Kathy's body. The nightshirt she was wearing when he left for work was nearly torn off. It was clear that the 19-year-old mother was dead. Warner ran from the townhouse and went to a neighbor's home. They called the police. Warner then went back into the townhouse and got Courtney. Kathy's murder had been brutal and rageful. She had been viciously beaten. The medical examiner said that based on the color of the bruises, she was beaten for approximately 15 minutes. She had also been strangled. But ultimately, she bled to death. There were three cuts on her neck. One was very deep and cut both her artery and her jugular. The murder weapon wasn't found at the crime scene, but the police suspected it was a pair of scissors. On Kathy's sweatpants, in blood, was the outline of the handles of a pair of scissors. While the murder was brutal, the crime scene was bizarre. It's believed that Kathy's body was positioned so that she could see her daughter in the room across the hall. The medical examiner thought that Kathy had been killed sometime shortly after 12 noon. So she may have been dead for about three hours by the time her body was found. Yet Courtney's diaper was relatively clean. It was just a bit wet. The police suspected that the killer changed the baby's diaper. It's believed that the killer also changed the radio station. When the police arrived, it was tuned to an easy listening station. It wasn't a station that Kathy listened to. The police speculated that the killer had showered and changed his clothes before leaving. The water in the bath was still running when the police arrived. They found a size 9 bloody footprint on the bathroom floor. The phone line in the bedroom had been cut. On the pink phone, the police found a bloody fingerprint. Perhaps most bizarre were the written messages. The police tech had a new piece of forensic equipment. It was a handheld wand with an alternate light source, special powder, and goggles that revealed possible evidence like hairs and fibers that couldn't be seen with the naked eye or easily missed. But in this case, they found several things that had been written in marker and apparently cleaned off. On the refrigerator, they found the words Metallica and Harley was here. Then on Kathy's inner thigh, they found another message. It read, I was here. The police suspected that Kathy knew her killer. There were no signs of a break-in or forced entry. When Michael Warner returned home, he said he put his key in the lock and turned the key. But you can say for certain that the door was locked when he got home. A neighbor told the police they had been out that day. When they returned home, they found pry marks on the door as if someone had tried to break in. The police believe that this was a ploy used by the killer to make it look like the murder was a home robbery gone wrong. But nothing Kathy's home had looked like the killer went there to rob the house. Nothing had been stolen and it didn't appear that the killer had attempted to steal anything. Instead, they believe that the killer went there with the intentions of either having consensual sex with Kathy or to rape her. Like with most investigations, the police focus on the victim's romantic partner. However, the police were able to eliminate Michael Warner as a suspect. He had a solid alibi. He worked at a paper plant an hour's drive from his home. His employer and co-workers confirmed that he was there all day. 
Plus, there was no motive. By all accounts, Michael and Kathy had a solid relationship and they were planning a life together. Finally, his fingerprints and footprints didn't match the ones left at the crime scene. The police's next suspect, Michael Howard, was the man Kathy claimed was Courtney's father. Howard did not think he was the father. After the murder, Howard did a court-ordered paternity test. He was the father of Courtney. But the police didn't think he was the killer. His prints didn't match those left at the crime scene, and he had an alibi. He was at work, and they hung out with his girlfriend. The police had a third suspect, and he seemed like he was the most promising. It was 19-year-old Troy Schulteis. He was Michael Warner's best friend and ex-boyfriend of Kathy. Schulteis' nickname was Harley, which was the name written on the fridge. Schulteis was also a big fan of the heavy metal band Metallica, which was also written on the fridge. Also, his truck was seen at the crime scene that afternoon. The police interviewed Schulteis. He did not have an alibi for the time of the murder. He admitted that he wrote the messages on the fridge and on Kathy's leg. But he claimed he did it months earlier at a party. He wrote them in red marker and then wiped them off. The police thought he was the killer, so they arrested him three days after the murder. However, once again, his prints didn't match those left at the crime scene. So after spending nine days in jail, he was released. There was one other odd thing that happened in Three Rivers on the day Kathy Schwartz was killed. 24-year-old Christina Shelton and her three-year-old daughter were driving towards Centerville, a village west of Three Rivers. As Shelton was speeding, she crossed the center line and crashed into the St. Joseph River. Shelton's three-year-old daughter was rescued, but Shelton did not survive. Shelton lived in the same townhouse complex as Kathy Schwartz. Her accident happened around the same time Kathy was killed. The police thought it was possible that Shelton killed Kathy and then killed herself out of guilt. But like the other suspects, her prints did not match the ones left by the killer. The police speculated that Shelton saw something so disturbing that she ran away and lost control. However, since she was never questioned, the police don't know if her death had any connection to Kathy's murder. The police believed a serial killer might have murdered Kathy. Portage, Indiana is about 100 miles west of Three Rivers. On March 26, 1989, George and Lisa Kopanakis left their apartment in Portage to go out for the evening. They were gone for about three hours. When they returned home, they made a horrifying discovery. Someone had forced their patio door open and entered their home. With a butcher knife, they slit the throats of the couple's two dogs. Then they threw a rug over the bodies. After the disturbing incident, the couple moved to another home in Portage. Several months after the dogs were killed, on August 4th and 5th, George was out of town for business. Lisa's sister tried to contact her several times but could not, so on August 5th, she went over to the couple's apartment. She found her 23-year-old sister dead under a rug. She had been beaten and stabbed a dozen times. She supposedly had her throat cut nearly to the point of decapitation with a pair of scissors. It's believed that she was killed either on the afternoon of August 4th or the morning of August 5th. She was murdered about eight months after Kathy was killed. The second murder was committed in Dillman, Indiana, which is about 90 miles south of Three Rivers. A few months after Lisa Kopanakis was killed, on August 13, 1989, 18-year-old Cherry Herr was home alone in her family's house. She was beaten and stabbed to death. She had suffered a fractured skull and she had been stabbed in the throat. There were several similarities between the murders. All the victims were young white women who were home alone during the day. If Lisa Kopanakis was killed on August 4th, then they were all murdered on a Friday. Also, all the murders were incredibly violent. However, the police couldn't find any connections between the murders. The police didn't even determine if one person was responsible for the two murders in Indiana.
The police investigated Kathy Swartz's murder for years. Within three years, they eliminated a thousand suspects. There were even rumors that the killer was one of the police officers in the city. All the officers were fingerprinted and eliminated as suspects. So despite having solid pieces of evidence, the case went cold. The police believed that Troy Schulteis was most likely the killer. Many people in the town believed that as well. Schulteis eventually moved away because of the suspicion that hung around him. The problem was that his fingerprints and footprints didn't match the ones found at the crime scene. The police thought Schulteis may have had a partner and he was the one who left the prints. Specifically, they thought his partner was his father. They theorized that after the murder, his father went to the crime scene and cleaned up. This would explain why there was nothing found at the house that connected Schulteis to the murder. The police were not able to get Schulteis' father's prints. He died, and the funeral director refused to let them get the prints without a warrant. In 2012, just over 23 years after the murder, the police reopened the case. Unfortunately, a lot of evidence had been lost over time. However, they still had the fingerprints and footprints. They also had the phone, which potentially had an important piece of evidence. That was a blood stain that belonged to a male. DNA testing proved it did not belong to the three main suspects, Kathy's fiance Michael Warner, Courtney's father Michael Howard, and her ex-boyfriend and prime suspect, Troy Schulteis. The police entered the DNA into the FBI's combined DNA index system, also known as CODIS. But no match was found. So the case went cold again. Ten more years passed. Then in May 2022, the Michigan State Police Crime Lab DNA director decided to send the DNA sample the private DNA company, Orthram Incorporated. A lot had changed in those 33 years. In 1988, the three biggest movies at the worldwide box office were Who Framed Roger Rabbit, Rain Man, and Coming to America. In 2022, the biggest movies in the world were Avatar, The Way of the Water, Top Gun Maverick, and Jurassic Park, World Dominion. 1988, the three biggest albums were Faith by George Michael, The Dirty Dancing Soundtrack, and Hysteria by Death Leopard. 2022's best-selling albums on the Billboard charts were Midnight's by Taylor Swift, Harry's House by Harry Styles, and Proof by BTS. Metallica, which had been written on the fridge, and the police thought the writing was a clue because it was the prime suspect's favorite band. In 1988, Metallica released their fourth studio album, The Highly Regarded and Justice for All. It was their first album with bassist Jason Newstead. Their previous bassist, Cliff Burden, was killed in September 1986 when the band's tour bus skidded off the road in Sweden. Over the next 33 years, Metallica released six more albums. Newstead quit the band in 2001 and was replaced with Robert Tujillo, who has been their bassist ever since. In 1988, new products included the Apple Scanner, the Sega Genesis game console, and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle action figures. The Ninja Turtle action figures were based on the comic series released in 1984 by Mirage Studios. The toys were a massive success and helped propel the franchise to one of the biggest franchises in the world. By 2022, there had been six feature films featuring the Ninja Turtles, four TV series, and dozens of video games, among other media. The franchise is considered to be worth $17 billion. Products you could get in 2022 included the Pixel Watch, the MetaQuest Pro VR system, and Apple iPhone 14. In 1988, foods available for the first time included McDonald's McChicken, Teddy Grahams, and the sports drink, Powerade. In 2022, you could eat a Popeye's black and chicken sandwich and early crackers and drink Prime sports drinks. Prime is promoted by social media influencers Logan Paul and KSI, who weren't alive when Kathy Schwartz was killed. In terms of criminal investigation, the biggest change was the discovery of the forensic genealogy process. This is when the DNA of an unknown person is inputted into public DNA databases with the hopes they'll find relatives of the killer. Then, it's a matter of mapping out their family tree. Then in January 2023, Orthram narrowed the DNA down to four brothers who grew up outside Three Rivers. 
There we have the DNA of one of the brothers. His DNA did not match what was left at the crime scene. Two of the brothers still lived in the area. They voluntarily gave samples of their DNA and they didn't match. The fourth brother, Robert Waters, had moved away from the area years earlier. Waters had problems with the law when he was young. He even spent time in a juvenile home. He met and married a woman who convinced him it was better to move out of the state and leave all the trouble behind. They eventually settled in South Carolina where he started a plumbing business and seemingly stayed out of trouble. Waters also had a connection to Kathy Schwartz. He was a childhood friend of her fiancé, Michael Warner. Waters and his girlfriend had visited Kathy and Warner about a month before the murder. Waters had never been a suspect and his prints were never taken. He had moved out of the state shortly after the murder and the police never followed up on it. In the spring of 2023, Waters was 54 years old. He was living in Beaufort, South Carolina with his wife. He was the father of two children. On April 30th, 2023, the police went to his house and asked him to come to the police station to discuss a cold case. He said he would come by the local police station, but he didn't show up. Instead, he called his lawyer. The lawyer called the police and the police told him it was best if Waters came to the police station. The detectives brought Waters to the police station later that day and took his fingerprints, footprints, and a DNA sample. All this was sent to the state crime lab in Michigan. It was a match to the evidence left at the crime scene. After 34 and a half years, the police had found Kathy Schwartz's killer. Robert Waters was placed under arrest and held in the Beaufort County Jail. Waters' family was shocked by his arrest and didn't believe he was capable of such a brutal crime. On May 6, 2023, Five days after he was arrested, 54-year-old Robert Waters was found dead in his jail cell. He had hanged himself with a bed sheet. It's believed that he killed himself during a guard shift change. After his death, the police officially closed Kathy Schwartz's murder. Many people are wondering if Waters killed anyone else, like Lisa Kopanakis and Sherry Herr. One problem is that in 1989, when the murders were committed, Waters was living about 1,800 miles away in Phoenix. However, the police think it's possible that he did kill other people. By the time of this recording, the police have not connected him with any other murders. Unfortunately, the murder case seriously damaged the lives of two people who were heavily involved in the case. One was Kathy's fiancé, Michael Warner. He said for a while he had an alcohol use disorder. He had problems holding down jobs. When the case was solved in 2023, he was unemployed and living with his mother. He often rides his bike around Three Rivers, collecting cans and bottles. The other person was Troy Schulteis. He had major problems with employment. He moved away from Three Rivers, but eventually moved back. When the case was solved, he was living in his mother's basement. His mother said that the pressure of being the prime suspect gave him health problems. Many people found it disturbing that two innocent men had difficult lives after the murder, but the killer got married, had kids, ran a successful business, and lived in a half a million dollar home. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you'd like to know more about the murder of Kathy Schwartz, Please check out Target 8's documentary, Left in Blood, where a lot of the information for this podcast came from. But that's all for this week. Please don't forget to check out criminallylisted.com if you have a case to suggest. Thank you again for listening. Please stay safe and take care of yourself.